When the whole family comes together to watch the game, nobody wants to miss a second of the action to run to the grocery store. With Instacart, you can get all your weekly groceries in as fast as an hour. Less time shopping means more game time. Let's go. Visit instacart.com to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. $10 minimum per order. Additional terms apply. Welcome in, everybody. It is our number two of Sports Daily. I'm Jacob Albrock. He's Tommy Caster. Jad Chambers producing for us. Glad to have you with us here as we make our way through a Reaction Monday. Uh, congratulations to Mark for winning our uh, Wind Surge vouchers there. Happy to give those away. Happy to send you to the game on us here at Sports Daily. Tommy, let's dig into this ballpark debate. Uh, the Royals are engaged in my opinion in some shenanigans here basically from what the the way that i take this is you've got two county and i don't i don't know the you know geography of kansas city tremendously well but you've got clay county which is the upper right quadrant right of the kansas city metro area and then you have jackson county which is where the royals currently are um in Missouri there right am I am I on there is that a, is that an easy way to describe I that I think that's uh, as, right yep as we I'd have to pull things. out a map so but I think that that's which right. is which is sort of the bottom right portion the Missouri side right because half of it's on Kansas essentially right. and, we, and we know the for the Royals for the most part we haven't heard any rumors of them trying to come to the Kansas side but you know the, the you've got the the bottom right part of the metro and the top right part of the metro and you know, a part of this new ballpark is always been, we've heard from the Royals, like taking care of Jackson County and like, you know, all the tax money for Jackson County that you've had, like you, your deal won't get worse. It'll be the same and all these things. But now there's this long, like opinion letter. I don't even know what this thing was from Clay County and like exploring options with Clay County and this creative idea to make a, you know, a North Kansas City uh, region, blah, 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 blah. And Jackson County's like, hang, hang on, what? Like, you're, you're trying to, like, sell everybody on the need and the desire to do this, and now you're going to flirt with a different county? We've been your partners in this, like, forever. What is happening here? So much so that, like, the mayor's involved, Mayor Lucas, who clearly is annoyed by this and, and doesn't want the royals to, you know, have an interstate bidding war going on. And to me, I sit back and I'm like, man, the royals are just trying to get get pu- as many public da- tax dollars as they can without, by the way, putting a good product on the field. And I'm like, what? Like, what are we doing here? Like, I don't know that it's nefarious necessarily, but if you're going to convince a region to get behind, like, this is the this is the worst thing that could happen. This paints the Royals in such a bad light to me, Tommy. Well, and now you've got Frank White involved, who I think is what, a, a commissioner or council member or something in Jackson yeah. County. You know, so you've got a Royals legend who is now chiming in and saying, what the heck is going on? What are the Royals doing? And and that's a bad look. That's bad optics when you've got a legend in Frank White who's now being critical of the conversations going on with the Royals in Clay County. I mean, that's probably almost as bad as George Brett getting involved. Like Frank White is one step down from George Brett when it comes to legends of the Royals franchise. And so this is, it's messy. And I, there's part of me, I almost wonder if this is intentional a little bit on the part of the Royals to be able to try to distract away from how bad the team is right now. Oh, no, I don't think it's that. I mean, come on. Like, I think that it's like, hey, let's get some other conversations going and try to like, have everybody ignore the fact that the team is so terrible right now. No, see, I think it's more about trying to get these two counties to to like bid against each other and pony up the most, you know, public money that they can so that the Royals have as little on the line with the new. That's what I see it as. Like how do we get 
how can we get these two, you know, because everyone's going to freak out, right? Like, oh, we can't lose the Royals. I don't know how much, I, I don't know. Like, I, to me, this rubs a lot of your fans the wrong way. A, at least it does to me. And again, that's not where I live. So I'm speaking a little out of turn in the sense that it's just like it's a far away pers- perspective on this. And, and I'm not from here or this region, right? Like, it's not, it, it's almost not my place. But as I look at it from an outsider's perspective, it's like, man, they're trying to get these two counties to bid against each other. And I don't know how I feel about it because that's what the Chiefs are doing when they're when they're flirting with going to the Kansas side, right? Like, that's what they're doing, too. Um, they're, they're trying to leverage more, I think, public dollars into building a new stadium and a new facility. And, like, the overall theme of that bugs me. And, and you know, and because— and I've said this a million times in the Chiefs scenario, like if you're the state of Kansas, yeah, we should do everything we can to get the Chiefs from a public perspective. It would become one of our greatest exports, NFL football, in a, as a, from a state's perspective. It really would. And so, I, I, and, and, and knowing that you're being manipulated that way, I'm still like, yeah, we should probably do that. I don't know that the Royals is the same. I don't, I don't know. You know, Major League Baseball is different than Minor League Baseball. A new downtown ballpark does put Kansas City at a higher profile. But I never really thought of it from a county versus county perspective there um, because they've always just sort of been partners with Jackson County, and that's always – that's that's been the impression we've been given in all of this until this. And to me, and I think this is why you see, like, the lawmakers, the mayor and, and Frank White, so annoyed and irritated is like, hang on a minute. Like, what – what is all this talk? Like, we haven't even right. – and I don't know what the behind-the-scenes conversations are, but, like, what, you, you can't all of a sudden, you know, go start flirting with somebody else. Like, we're trying to work through our own deal here. Yeah, keep in mind, too, that the Royals are under lease with Jackson County until the year 2030. So they've got another seven years with their right. current lease with Kauffman Stadium. So, you know, I, I don't know why County the county was- – quick to pull out and sure. say, hey, you better watch like, it here, you know. <laughs> you know, why, why in the world would Jackson County be willing to let the Royals out of their lease to go to a neighboring county to build a, a stadium? Right. So, I mean, that's going to play into it a little bit, too. I think one thing that is really interesting to watch in not just the Royals situation, but big picture with Kansas City in general, and we've talked about you know, could an NHL team make it to Kansas City? And, you know, the NBA looks to be, you know, probably not likely to happen, uh, you know, for that Metro. But as far as a big picture is concerned, there's something going on. And it's it's happened for the last several years where the states of Kansas and Missouri have entered into a truce with one another. And I don't know exactly, I mean, there's no legal bearing on this, right? But it's almost like a public, hey, Kansas isn't going to try to take away commerce from Missouri and vice versa. And so that's publicly the case. I don't know how shaky that is. And that's something to keep our eyes on because, you know, we've talked about the Chiefs and that's conjecture there and what that might look like. Um, That's one thing when you've got two states who are battling potentially something out like that. It's another thing when it's two counties in general in the same state that are, you know, fighting against each other and pitting taxpayers, you know, basically against each other in that regard. So I think big picture wise, I know that publicly there is this quote unquote truce between the two states, but I don't know how long that's going to last, and that's going to be really interesting to watch. Well, it does make you wonder, right? Is if if the Royals are clearly flirting with another county, would they flirt with another state? Would they yep. come across to the southwest portion of the Kansas City Metro? Uh, would they go, you know, into the Legends area, which is what everybody always points to, where you've got a racetrack and a soccer field and all this stuff? Already got a ballpark there. I mean, it's not obviously going to be able to work with the Royals, but. There's right. a ballpark that's already sitting right there uh, that you you could probably retrofit, you know, to fit a professional baseball team, and and so I think that that's part of it. Also, when you're looking but I think at, you want to get downtown, don't you? Don't you like you want to get downtown? And and I'm just seeing a comment here of JB, and I'm I'm glad that we're getting you know some some people interacting that know more of the Kansas City geography, uh, but JB says you you know North Kansas City, which is this clay county part is a suburb it'd be like putting them on the kansas side you know you can't you can't, it, it doesn't really fit the profile of downtown I, so i i that's that was my first reaction right is hang on a minute you can't go into another county in the renderings and things that we've seen there's like a specific place for this and so 
are you are you throwing that out the window now? Is this more about being downtown and you know, or is it more about? And this is probably where Mayor Lucas is annoyed. Is it more about being downtown and doing all that, or is it more about getting the most public dollars you can get? I don't know. This it certainly feels like it's now about getting the most public dollars you can get, and yeah. if that's the case, like one, that's, that's annoying. Clearly, what it's about. Clearly, if I'm a Jackson, if I'm a Jackson County resident, like that's that's really really annoying and and kind of undermines things a little bit. And then if I'm the state of Kansas, I'm like, well, hang on a minute here. Like, do we need to get involved in this? Like, do we need to make a phone call and say, hey, right. come on over. You want some da- You want some public money? Because Kansas and Missouri are in two different. Like, we're not in the same. We're not in the same place. Like, Kansas is still trying to drive these things, right? And, and Missouri's. I don't know. I, I just like the NFL is a no brainer. Whether Major League Baseball is a no brainer, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that. And and then it becomes also a question of like. For the Chiefs to come across, like for the overall economy, like how far down is that trickle for tax dollars? Like are we paying for that out of Wichita? I don't want to pay out of Wichita. I don't care where the Royals play. Like I don't I don't want to I, yeah. I don't want any of my money to do anything with, with that. So I it's a mess, man. And, and Look, it doesn't there, there's another me, I don't think. Yeah, there's another element to this, and that is the the sports wagering element a little bit. And I'm not saying that that's completely that's related to this. Because it's but dead it, again in Missouri. Right. It does show the difference between the state of Kansas and the state of Missouri and how you know uh, aggressive Laura Kelly, the governor of Kansas, was in approving sports wagering for this state. Meanwhile, you've got the state of Missouri where it's running into brick walls left and right. And, you know, it's it's crazy how you've got, for instance, look at the Chiefs, for example, and they've got an official sports betting partner and they've got all of this stuff. But you can't bet the games in the state, right? You got to go to the Kansas side to be able to do that. And so while that may not directly tie into new stadiums and that sort of thing, it does show an example of how aggressive the state of Kansas has been compared to the state of Missouri. It, yes. It, and that's why we have, like, I, people thought I was crazy, Tommy, when I said that the second that the Chiefs flirted the rumor, I, I went in and I said, guys, I think this is going to bring gambling to to the state of Kansas. I think it's going to get pushed through. And I was like, I don't, you know, and everyone kind of, and I was like, I'm just telling you, like, if, if there really is a chance that Kansas can get the Chiefs, they're going to do everything that, they, and they should. Like our lawmakers, it wasn't just Laura Kelly, it was all of them. They were like, oh yeah, right. let's uh, let's get on and all the, because that that's a you know, it was logical to me. Like this is this is like if because it, it's always kind of on the fence, and you know, I don't think people truly cared as much as they grandstanded to care if people were wagering. And then the second, like, this very obvious boon for the state comes to the table, everyone's like, yeah, okay, let's do this. Now, Missouri hasn't done that. And, and yeah. I don't know if and the they fought it of- tooth and nail. They, I mean, the, the yeah. politicians, I've, I've kind so of followed I- it in the hearings. The politicians are, are fighting it. Like, they don't, for whatever reason, don't want sports wagering, you know, in, in that state. And so it's going, you know, in a lot of different directions. And, and it's going I don't in all know directions, enough about but Missouri but positive, politics right? but, and lobbying and all that. I don't know right, enough but, about it to know. But here's the other thing to keep in mind and how it all relates when you're talking about the Chiefs and potentially, you know, could they ever come to, to the state of Kansas? Think about this. While they're might be a truce between the two states and so you're not going to see probably kansas publicly courting the chiefs to come over to the kansas side if the state makes it very attractive behind the scenes and the chiefs then choose kansas then well, are you really that. breaking that truce right like you're not publicly coming out and saying it but you're you're cultivating a landscape with you know wagering and public dollars and all of these other things where it becomes really attractive for the professional teams to cross the border at that point all bets are off i'm i'm stunned that the chiefs flirting with kansas has not driven the you know the the betting thing in Missouri. I don't know Missouri politics. Don't know them at all. Like, I don't know the reputation. I don't know the history. I don't know who they are. I don't know, like, their casino lobby. I don't know anything. I don't know anything about Missouri politics. But Kansas, generally speaking, when push comes to shove, is, and and Kansas has a reputation of this from an outsider's perspective, and and I see it to a large degree, is, you know, kind of level-headed on certain things and, like, getting a big battery factory or two or three like they have now. 
Like, there's sort of unity in that, balancing a budget after some problems. There's been some some unity in that, and some there's, there's a bit of a mess, and there's always going to be politics involved. But, like, usually in the state of Kansas, that's how you have, I think, a, a Democratic governor – multiple times now in a state that largely leans to the other side that that's that's the reputation Kansas has I think it's an interesting reputation so yeah I think Kansas will be much more unified in its approach not just to the Chiefs and look Major League Baseball teams want to be downtown NFL teams don't care about being downtown like it's more about where can I get enough parking right where can I get like they don't they don't care about that Major League Baseball teams do and if John Sherman moves the Royals and does not end up downtown. Like, if you're going to convince people that you need to have a new ballpark, the only the only thing that you have is to say we're going to put them downtown. And then you don't end up kind of being downtown in the first place? Like, that, I don't know. I, I think it's a bad look, and I do think it's just leverage. The Royals trying yeah, to get more public dollars. They're not going to be – I really don't think they're going to be in Clay County. I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, look, I think that if you were definitively ranking – not the likelihood, but the desire, like where it's best for the Royals to be. I think that you would say downtown is probably number one. Probably the Kansas side is number two. Staying in Jackson County is probably number three. And then Clay County is down there at the bottom. Like, I, just, I don't I don't see that happening. This is purely conjecture. And I see it as, you know, just a way to, to pit a couple of different neighboring counties against each other to try to come up with the most public dollars possible. And it, John Sherman's doing his job, right? He's trying to get public dollars. I get it. But I don't like it. I don't understand it. I never understand why pro sports franchises need public dollars to build their stadiums. Like, you're not giving us a revenue share. You are through taxes, but you're not giving us a revenue share of your ticket sales. Right. Like, let's come up with an equitable conversion of how many public dollars went into building that, and we'll take that much of the profit. Like, whatever the MLB revenue sharing numbers are, we want that cut back, too. And and it doesn't work that way. And I'm like, what? Why? Yeah. Like, how? Who was the first one to create this Pandora's box of public dollars to build private businesses? It, it, and 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 for you know things that drive a ton of high paying jobs, that's one thing. Like, but major league baseball team, like, yeah, you bring jobs in to the stadium, but you're also killing other jobs from the other stadium. So, like, what is? What's the net gain here from a taxpayer perspective? I don't I don't know what it is. I, I don't know. And that, so it bugs me. And so like Denver, I believe, and L.A., the two new big football facilities and state, those are all privately funded from what I understand. Like Kroenke built that whole thing by himself in L.A. And Denver, they're doing the same thing, again, from what I understand. Wait, like do that. Like just build it yourself and then keep all the money you make from it. Well, and, and here's the other thing, too, that I, I know I'm oversimplifying the entire thing because you're, we're talking politics and all this other stuff. But I guarantee you, if the team was a little bit better, you could oh, probably yeah. have a little bit of element. a more receptive public yeah. willing to move your team, right? If like, there's no is motivation right now, you know? If this conversation's happening in 2012... It's yep. a very different conversation, and that's the Royals' biggest issue right now is they've got to figure out how to get the product on the field to a point where everybody wants them. They've got to be really I mean, we're before, careful. We're, we're a week, we are a week before Memorial Day, and the Royals have been irrelevant in the American League Central for a month at this point. Yeah. I mean, come on. Like, the, there would be a better appetite for the taxpayers – to, you know, hey, maybe maybe we can offer up some public dollars here, you know, to bring a successful franchise, you know, to the city, uh, to our county, to whatever it is, wherever, downtown, whatever it is, you'd probably have a better appetite for that if the product on the field was better. And it's not right now. And it hasn't been outside of two years. It hasn't been in more than 30, 35 years, you know, so where's the appetite there? Well, it, the appetite is there. We saw that because they they were near the I mean they were right up at the top in attendance in those years they were competitive. Like it is as simple as them just needing to be good. Like that's it. Like you know, they don't some teams face challenges of even when we're good, we can't draw. The Royals don't face that challenge. Right. They've they've shown us that. When they're good, they draw. Like they, go look at their attendance numbers when they were competitive like that. And they were very good drawing team. They can't figure that out. Now, we pay more attention to the Royals than most because we're the flagship station, obviously, and we have interest in their future and all those things. So 
we we pay more attention and they are scoring more. They didn't have a good offensive series at all against the White Sox, right? They didn't have it like like really poor offensive series this past weekend in Chicago. But it does become and, and the Royals will get more interesting toward the middle of the season as the trade deadline comes in to play for sure. But it is still like where's the long term hope? And uh, and the question's going to become in any individual offseason as John Sherman is having these conversations, like even if it's just for conjecture, like you're going to go need to invest some payroll dollars, right? Like even if it doesn't make sense on the field, at least show the fans like you're committed to doing right. this. If you're that- asking, if you're asking the fan base to subsidize a new stadium, then the least John Sherman can do is invest in the product on the field. Well, I right? invest, invest more. I think he is investing in the product on the field, but invest more, obviously like in more obvious ways like we're going to bring in two decent free agents not two really bad free agents that kind of nobody else wanted and we're just like oh yeah we'll take them for maybe a discount no like some real legitimate you know like starting pitching type and and i know that that's not the smart thing to do because they're not close enough to do that on the field but that's this dilemma that they face right they're not close enough to make that push which i think that they will and i think john sherman will when the time's right but the time's not right and now under all the new management and all that stuff we'd hoped that some of the young players that were struggling in the old regime would get better and they haven't um you know so they have it all right let's go to the phone lines real quick bill on the line wants to talk about this royal stadium bill what's on your mind welcome into sports daily do we still have bill jad we might have lost. We might have lost Bill. Bill, if you want to chime back in, you can give us a call. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, if you want to, if you want to get your thoughts in, Bill, we'll take you on the other side. Uh, I hop hotline eight six nine twelve forty. If you want to weigh in on this Royals conversation, uh, you can do it. It's interesting. It's fascinating. I'm fascinated by this. I think that it's the wrong play uh, to to go after this type of thing for the Royals at this moment. You got to be good to do what they're trying to do. I think. 869-1240, we'll come back. More Sports Daily right after this. Welcome back, everybody. Sports Daily. On KFH, Jacob Albrock, Tommy Castor with you. Uh, Tommy, have you followed all the latest in realignment? ACC annoyed teams are, you know, flirting. I mean, it's a foregone conclusion, right? The ACC. I, I, the question to me becomes, like, how quickly does this happen? How quickly do we see the ACC not look like it currently looks? And I think by this time next year, there will be things in motion that will make that happen. I think it's going to come much quicker than this grant of rights. I think the the one thing that makes it interesting is that, you know, the, uh, the climate of the media economy is cooling significantly. And so I don't know how much appetite there's going to be in that regard and how much they can navigate that. That may delay this, but it's coming. And no matter what the ACC does, If the Big Ten and the SEC come calling for any school, those schools will leave, and they should leave. And there's nothing anybody else can do about that. There's nothing the ACC can do about that. There's nothing the Big 12 can do about that. There's nothing you can do about it. I mean, it's a foregone conclusion at this point. I mean, I guess you can try and put a Band-Aid on it and and survive, but if you put a Band-Aid on it, your conference and your teams and your members are all making less money. But the Big 12 just proved to us, Tommy, that even without Texas and Oklahoma, they're making more money now with the New Deal. That same thing will happen in the ACC, right? If those those five to seven you know schools get poached by the other two leagues, everybody else is going to still make more money than they're currently making. So I don't even know internally what the appetite's going to be to stay and, and remain as things are right now. Because history's telling them, right, and what the pac is able to get and the struggles they're having and what the Big 12 was able to get, that it's still going to be better. Like your law, your your overall loss may still be a net gain if you're, I don't know, uh, who's one of the mid- Louisville, right? And I think that you know one thing that uh, the these other conferences, the ACC, the Pac-12, that they will look back on, 
you know, and, and probably kick themselves a little bit, at least the Pac-12 in that regard, is that the Big Ten and the SEC, they struck while the iron was hot. Like, they got their deal done when the appetite had been, it was never bigger, you know, than when they were able to get their media deals done. Same thing with the Big 12. Like, they were able to get a deal done aggressively, uh, proactively, they were able to jump in and get a deal done that benefited the member schools. And now, and I agree with you. I mean, we've read all these different articles, uh, at least I have over the last few weeks about what's happening in the, you know, sports media landscape and ESPN has done a ton of layoffs and like all of this stuff. The appetite I think is cooling a little bit, uh, you know, from a media perspective on, you know, I don't know. I think they're still going to be able to get deals done, but probably not as good of a deal, you know, as the SEC got the Big Ten, got the Big 12, got all of that. You know, so the, this definitely, you know, when we're, I don't know, five years down the line, 10 years down the line, and we're looking back on this realignment era, really, I mean, it's it's that old saying that what fortune favors the bold, right? Like the, the conferences that jumped in aggressively head first and they were on the forefront of it, they were the ones that got the payday. I don't know. I don't know what the ACC is going to do here. They'll either learn from history or they won't. Right? They'll either they'll either do and be aggressive, or they'll wait until they get poached and long term. I think make less money because there's no chance this league stays together till like right. what is it 2032? Like it's yeah, not going to not happen. a chance. So what's the aggressive play then for them? <sighs> to hmm. I don't know. That's that's the issue here because. Well, the aggressive play right now is to keep all your members and merge, right, with the Big 12. That's the aggressive play. Right. I don't know what the appetite from the TV networks will be for that. That's the that's going to be the problem is because ESPN probably loves the deal they're currently in and is in a challenging, again, media economic climate. That's the aggressive play, to go merge with the Big 12 now. The But the problem is... Again, you can do that, but the teams that the Big Ten and the SEC want, are all, they're going to be gone. Like, whatever teams are determined to be desirable by those leagues, those teams will leave. So yeah. how do you merge with that so obviously looming over everything, right? You're not going to convince Clemson that they're going to be in a better position in a merged league as good as that will be than they would be if they went to the SEC, for example. Because it's, not, with Florida I mean, it's State. not true. Right. It's just not true. So I don't know how you – like those two things – there's almost like a chicken and an egg, right? You you sort of you sort of have to wait for that to happen, I think, to some degree because, it's go, again, it's going to happen. Or I, I guess you can bring them to the table and just say let's all do this. But but the problem is those schools like if they if they know that the Big Ten or the SEC is interested, how do you even pretend to be interested in anything else? Because that's that is going to be your best case scenario, I think, financially at least in the short term. So I don't know what the quick answer is, but I know the conversations need to be having now, need to be being had now, like. John Sherman, not John Sherman. We just talked about John Sherman. Brett Yormark and the ACC commissioner, who I don't know that person's name off the top of my head, need to be having conversations now, realistic ones too. Like, what are the teams you think are going to leave, right? Like, let's be honest about this. Just man to man, okay? Those are the that Now let's begin to just explore some conversations with the networks. If that is to happen... What does this look like to you? Is there an appetite for this? Is there an appetite to add basically all those teams to the current Big 12 deal, right? Is that is that desire there? We know that basketball is this secondary thing, but it's it's also an important thing because that piece of it if the Big 12 and the ACC merged, you'd have the second best basketball league in the world. Right, hands down, not close. Best basketball league outside of the NBA on the planet. Most entertaining, anyway. Um, so that's a piece of it, too, to bring to the table. I just don't know what the appetite is from the media right now until we get the economy like back in, back in order. I don't know how long that's going to take. And 
I don't know what to do with the teams that are so clearly going to leave, which again, I, I don't blame them. I would do the same thing. Like if the SEC or the Big Ten comes calling, I'm gone, right? Because I'll make more money. And and for public institutions, I don't discount the fact that there's almost an obligation to do that, right? Like if you're a public institution and there is an opportunity for the institution to generate that much more revenue without tax dollars. I think that there's an obligation to do that. Private, you can do whatever you want. Public, you if, if Florida State is offered that spot, they have to do their due diligence right. and take that spot. They owe that to the taxpayers. We know that football is driving the ship on all of this, right? Like that's obviously, that's a no-brainer that it's football, football, football. I get all that. But, man, that basketball league, if the Big 12 and ACC merged, I mean, can you imagine a basketball league that has Kansas, Duke, and North Carolina all in the same league? I mean, come on. And then, of course, all the other ones, your Baylor and your, you know, uh, Texas Tech and all these other, you know, schools and teams that are Houston, all these other basketball uh, heavy uh, schools that are going to be in the league. But, man, a KU Duke North Carolina league? would be incredible. Uh, and so, I, again, like the the dollars, the revenue, all of that will always be driven by football. And and by the way, Duke and North Carolina, they don't have slouches of football programs either. Like, they're pretty solid, you know. No. So, I, I mean, that would be, Duke's not, be I don't, incredible. Duke's not in this conversation, I don't think, to go to the SEC or the Big Ten, by the way. Right. So, the, the, t- the schools, like, it's Virginia Tech, Virginia, Miami, Florida State, Clemson, North Carolina and North Carolina State. Those are the teams listed. I would be surprised if it's actually all those teams. Um, I think it's more likely to be, you know, Florida State, Miami, North Carolina, maybe Virginia. Um, and, and that's probably it. And so I think there's plenty of gain, obviously, for the Big 12. And, and I do uh, – here's what I'm happy about, Tommy, selfishly for like us in this part of the world. The conversations that need to be happening – I think we're comfortable enough now at this point to to think that Brett Yormark's having them, right? Yeah, like, for th- sure, th- th- we're not we're not going into this thinking, please, Big Twelve, be aggressive, please, be aggressive, please, be aggressive. We know and he's not being sitting aggressive. back on his laurels either. I mean, you know, there was a report I think on Friday that he was having conversations with Connecticut, right? You know, and and so having those those conversations with the most recent NCAA basketball champion in UConn, you know, having those conversations right now. Um, you know, shows that even with the expansion that the Big 12 has been able to pull off, he's not done. He's not comfortable. Uh, you know, it, the reports are that he wants to be in the New York market and UConn will allow him to be in that New York market, you know, a little bit better than what the Big 12 currently is. So, I mean, those conversations are are ongoing right now. Uh, and, and so I, I think that we have all it, it's very rare for me, by the way, you know, to say, I'm putting my trust in someone and I implicitly trust them with the decisions. I, I trust Brett Yormark and, and the, the direction that he's going and trying to take this conference. I do too. I do too, because I know he's being aggressive and I don't know what he's going to be able to accomplish, but I know he's being aggressive, which is what needs to happen. But kind of like period. Like if you're not aggressive in this current environment, you're going to get left behind. A you're going to get die. left behind. Yep, 869-1240, the IHOP hotline. Uh, When we come back, we'll talk Wichita State softball. The season ends in Stillwater. Uh, We'll talk about what happened, how wild and crazy that regional was for them. Uh, We'll hit that uh, as we make our way through and begin to get ready for the now baseball postseason for Wichita State and track, by the way, uh, which is coming up here pretty quick. We'll do all that next. Sports Daily, Albrecht and Caster, coming right back. All right, welcome back in, everybody, to Sports Daily. Glad to have you here with us. Um, We are happy to be here. Um, Man, softball, Tommy. Ah, Mm. ah, So close. So close. Uh, What a a run. What a generation, uh, I guess, this roster has provided for us. So it was wild and crazy, man, if you didn't see it. Uh, so they had all the rain delays Friday. So the Nebraska game actually moved over to ESPN plus, but that one, they were down five, nothing. We left the air after the delays in our 10 o'clock newscast. I was working Friday night and they were down five Oh, 
And by the time I got home, it was like five to two or five to three. And they complete that comeback. And they go up and they get the win six to five. It was dramatic, exciting. It was like, all right, they finally unlocked. They come back on Saturday. They play Oklahoma State in the winner's bracket game, and they get blanked. Oklahoma State, there were you know, a lot of you know, mistakes or bad fortune for Wichita State. And then they come back and play Nebraska again in an elimination game, and they get up early. Lauren Mills has a couple of bombs, but they kept giving up leads. They went up. They had a couple of runs. They were, I think, three runs ahead in the seventh and give up the lead and go to extra innings. Then in the ninth, in extra innings, they get up two runs, and give up the lead and ultimately the game, and that's how the season ends. And that is a grueling way to end it. Um, I'm not sure, though, even if they got the win against Nebraska, I'm not sure that they were hitting the way they needed to be hitting in general to go beat Oklahoma twice in a row. So, you know, the ultimate outcome may be similar. It is. It sucks that it ended that way, but... They were exciting games, man. They were really, really good, and it was a team that you know gave us a lot this year. And uh, disappointing end, but looking back, and, and ultimately wildly successful season again as Wichita State uh, comes away with 44 wins on the year and begins the stages of upgrading facilities and things. And the future is bright. But Sidney McKinney, who you know one of the best players in the world, man, man, end of an era. End of an era with Sidney McKinney. Um, yeah, I mean, look, like that regional was so exciting. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. Even though Wichita State didn't make it to the championship game, um, they certainly were entertaining throughout the entire regional. Uh, that opening game against Nebraska was a ton of fun to watch. Um, and then, of course, you know, going back and, and you know playing again, playing Nebraska again, that's really hard to do you know, beat a team like that, you know, a couple times in a row. Uh, they didn't have their their best stuff against Oklahoma State, uh, you know, and, and so ultimately it didn't work out for them. And that was one of the big fears, right? And that's always been the Achilles heel um, of this current roster for Wichita State is, you know, not quite being at the level to host a regional and then knowing that you're going to have to go to either Norman, Stillwater, or Fayetteville. Uh, and all three of those, you know, locations are – Really, really, really difficult. And, you know, yeah. I, I think that when you're looking back on this era of Shocker softball, and they're not done, by the way, right? Like, they've got, a, a you know, great returners, and Allison Barnard's going to be back. They've got some really good pitching that's coming back. Alex Aguilar was great, uh, you know, in her freshman year, and they've got some really good hitters that are coming back and returning. Uh, so they've got a lot of firepower returning, uh, you know, to this team next season. But this particular era – with Sidney McKinney, who is the best softball player on the planet. Uh, I, I think that that's ultimately, yeah, they're fun, they're entertaining, they're, they're exciting to watch. Um, could never really get over that hump to be considered one of the elite teams in the country in college softball. Yeah, it, it's it's tough. I, I think that, I, I the, you know, the future, Sidney McKinney is, Again, a number one draft pick to me, the most famous and you know recognizable and influential athlete since Ron and Fred at Wichita State, and that's considering they've had like some NBA guys come through. But when you're talking about like investment in the community and all that stuff, um, and time spent, which is also a factor, but it's not just Sidney McKinney that they're losing. They're losing Lauren Mills, who had a couple of bombs in that game, who's been one Zoe of the most Jones. enjoyable players in Zoe Jones. Yeah, so uh, you know it's. It's tough. It's going to be – they're going to have to – but but we've seen now some really young players play really well for them. And, you know, moving forward, Addie Barnard's going to be, you know, sort of the banner carrier for that. And they'll be fine. And, you know, they've done such a great job in those facilities. And I, I think once the facilities get there, it really just becomes can you continue to grow. There's no reason to think that they can't. It is always unnerving to lose, you know, the kind of talent that they're going to lose this – season but it'll be fine and they'll and they'll be okay and they'll retool and reload and do all those things and they've actually done a really nice job in the portal um so they're building a reputation which matters when it comes to the portal wichita state baseball and you'll hear these games here with us on kfh begins the postseason tomorrow and they will play memphis um and they get it done they're, they'll play the last game of the day it's a scheduled Basically, it's 47 minutes after the 3 o'clock game. They don't even try to give you a game time. 
So you're talking it's going to be 7, 730 probably if things go on time. And they'll open against Memphis, just looking against Memphis. They took two of three against Memphis in Wichita this regular season. Uh, so take anything from that if you'd like. You know, in, in the postseason, it becomes a question of pitching and, you know, how does that all line up and teams are all scrambling a bit. And I think that's what we like about Wichita State, right? Like that's that's one thing in this postseason that we feel like Wichita State, you know, can have some success with is is pitching and, and the depth there. They've got, you know, Peyton Tolley, Grant Adler, um, they've thrown tons of innings for them, and Clark Candiotti, is it just those three? Do they need to pitch a bullpen game? I don't know. And and I think that you just line them up that way, Adler, Tolley, Candiotti, which has you know, sort of been the success. Ma- I, I don't know how you do that. That's all strategic, and in conference tournaments, it, it gets really interesting. But what we do know is they got to win it, right? They've got to win the conference tournament to get through. So these will be as highly anticipated, I think, Shocker baseball games as we've had in a while because it feels like they can win it yeah we always know that's the path in recent years but this year it feels like they have a decent shot they swept east carolina they can win this thing i mean it's that simple the path is right there for them it really is it's clear as day they know exactly the objective they know exactly what they have to do in the conference tournament to make it to the postseason and that's win the dang thing right they've got the hitting to do it they've got the pitching to do it we've seen them have a high level of success against really, really good baseball teams earlier this season. And, oh, by the way, they had a really good weekend series against UCF uh, to, to wrap up the, the regular season over the weekend. So the momentum is there. Um, you know, they've got the – that they're playing like they could win a, a conference championship, a conference tournament championship. The question becomes – can they sustain it throughout the entire tournament? And so it gets going tomorrow. We'll see how it goes. But I, I certainly think that, you know, this is not a situation where, you know, you're like, oh, you know, it'd be great if they could catch fire and maybe it'll happen. No, I think that they literally have the talent and the coaching and the roster to be able to get it done. Yeah, I do, too. Um, I do, too. Ah, <sighs> we'll see. We'll hear those games uh, with us here. It'll be fun. I'm excited about it, and Mike Kennedy will have the call. It was good to talk to them on, what was that, Friday. They had a wacky, by the way, they played games. They just needed one to clinch that three seed. They got it in the second game, and then it didn't, they didn't really have anything else to play for uh, other than pride, which, of course, you always play for pride. But that's what's on the table now. So we turn our attention then to, um, you know, to Wichita State baseball this week, and then you've got track and field. And they will begin theirs as well to the West preliminaries. Um, so that's also there. And those begin on Wednesday. Um, and that gets a little trickier to follow. But th- those come on Wednesday through the weekend into Saturday. And then if anybody makes it through, you get the outdoor championships later this month. All right, we're going to come back. We're going to wrap this up for a Monday edition of Sports Daily. All Brockton Caster, don't go away.